Okay, let's just ignore the bad cable management. I promise it'll get better, so shh. Anyway, I have been recommending iPads over lower end Macs for the past like two years simply because the ARM based chips on the inside have been equally capable, if not more so than the lower end i3 and i5 chips found in MacBook Pros and MacBook Airs. But gone are those days. Apple has now implemented their own in-house chip into these new lower end laptops of theirs. It's the M1 chip, which is based off of A14, which is found in the iPad Air um, for that matter. And that's why in this video, I want to compare the iPad Air to the MacBook Air because now they are more comparable than ever as they are based off of the same TSMC manufactured chip and architecture and all that good stuff. So before we get into this video here where I can help you decide which device is right for you, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like here, of course, if you want to. I'll leave a comment if you have any questions, suggestions, or opinions. And of course, and of course, and of course, that's like my main catchphrase. If you are subscribed, be sure to click the bell icon as it does help the channel out a lot. This is what happens when it's like three in the morning. You just start losing your mind. So although we will be comparing hardware or specifications between these two devices, um, of course, this is gonna also be like a form factor comparison, like which device is for what kind of person. Although I would say both are aimed at a similar demographic, but of course, these devices are fundamentally different. The iPad Air 4 is very much a tablet with you know great accessories here. And then of course, the MacBook Air is by itself just a laptop. Although both of these setups here uh, come to around 900 to 1000 USD, depending on what kind of uh, discounts you're getting or where you are in the world. And of course, Air is in the name of these products, iPad Air and MacBook Air, so it seems even more fitting to compare them. And with that said, let's first up talk about their biggest differentiating factor, their displays. So iPad, of course, is very much a tablet which accommodates multi-touch with your finger and also input with the Apple Pencil. One of my favorite features is Scribble, so I can like write in text fields in pretty much any app. And um, so I can search GoodNotes, which is a note-taking app that I use. And um, this is one of the biggest perks of having an iPad now any iPad for that matter. Note taking with the Apple Pencil is just a fantastic experience. I do it all the time with my iPad Pro and I have my notes synced up with my iPad Air here. So this is from my accounting class. We're learning about LIFO and FIFO and other accounting goodness or whatever. So I can like sort of demo the low latency here where I can write. It's just a really beautiful experience even at 60 Hertz, although the iPad Pro has a higher refresh rate that we all know and love. And speaking of 60 Hertz, the MacBook Air also has a 60 Hertz display. There's no Mac in existence that has a higher refresh rate and that's fine with me. I mean, I've been chilling at 60 Hertz with my laptops for years. I don't necessarily need it with the Mac, nor do I actually like it. I kind of like it more for, you know, like gaming PCs and stuff like that, but it kind of gives me a headache on Macs. So I'm perfectly happy with the displays on both of these. They're similar, of course, or identical in refresh rate. And touching on display here, like the actual display panels, both are really nice. I mean, they're sharp, they're colorful. I believe they both have P3 color. How However, I think the iPad Air gets a bit brighter at 500 nits compared to the max brightness with the MacBook Air, which is 400 nits. So if you're using a device outside or want to, then the iPad Air might be a bit better in that regard. And of course, both can accommodate multitasking. So I can open up Safari here and then open up, oh, let's just say GoodNotes on the right. And of course, on a Mac, you can do the same with you know, Safari, for example. And then I can open up maybe, uh, I don't know, the calendar app if I wanted to for some reason. And then I can bring it over here in Mac OS. And there you go. And one advantage with the MacBook Air is having the fine point of input with the trackpad, which I will say is a really great quality of any Mac or any MacBook for that matter. Apple makes the best trackpads hands down or some of the best. But of course, with this display here, you get a 13 inch canvas, which allows you to see a bit more. And also if you're just doing all your input with a keyboard and a trackpad, you do see more in general while your hands are sort of in the way on an iPad. So if I had to get a lot of work done on one device, me personally, I might choose a MacBook Air simply because the display is bigger and I like having a trackpad and a stylus. Although with the Magic Keyboard, you can get a similar experience. So although it's a little bit more iPad-like, a little bit chunkier, you still get that. Although I will say it is a little bit shrunk down unlike uh, the iPad Pro 12.9 inches Magic Keyboard and trackpad, but it's still a nice laptop experience nonetheless. And I really do enjoy the Magic Keyboard on this and this as well. I mean, it's very similar, I would say, in terms of travel and feel and whatever. So um, that is something that's great about iPad. It's become more adaptable or more comparable to um, pre-existing MacBooks, of course, like the MacBook Air as well. But this is a smaller device and with a smaller device comes lesser screen real estate. So that's something to keep in mind, I will say. And also in terms of in-lap use, of course, this is great for just holding it and like watching YouTube videos and stuff like this is very much a tablet, of course. But the MacBook Air, I mean, like any laptop for that matter, that's nicely balanced or whatever. This is a very lap oriented device. Like you can very comfortably sit down on the couch and use this. It's not very like flat footed, if you know what I mean. Like I say flat footed because like 
Look at how flat the bottom of this is. And it's always like teetering on my knees and stuff like this. I can put in my lap and just have a more comfortable experience, I would say. Although you can definitely do it here. You just gotta make sure you're not on like an incline or anything. Like you have to have your, your knees or your legs just flat out. With this, you can get more comfortable and you know, it's, it's a laptop. It's by design a laptop. So you're gonna have a better in lap experience. Sounds kind of weird, but you know what I'm saying. And kind of going back to the topic of keyboards, like I said, the quality is pretty much identical. Both of these keyboards are magic by Apple's definition. However, once again, this keyboard is definitely a bit more cramped, a bit more uncomfortable to type on, whereas the MacBook Air's keyboard is just perfect. I could type emails and documents and stories and whatever on here for days. So if you wanna do a lot of typing, I would recommend the MacBook Air any day, or if you want a bigger iPad with a bigger keyboard, then go with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro or a used one. But if you wanna stay within this price range, I would honestly go with the MacBook Air. Next up, I wanna talk about biometrics. And conveniently enough, these devices have a very similar setup. They have Touch ID implemented into their power button. So with the iPad Air, I can unlock like so. And then with the MacBook Air, I can just rest my finger on the little power button slash fingerprint sensor, and boom, you're in to your desktop or your home screen. You can also use this to make payments through Apple Pay and also use it to lock other apps and stuff like that. So yeah, very convenient and intuitive with both. Next up, let's talk about speaker quality. And I don't really like to be the judge of this because like the audio stuff is sort of subjective. Although I will say, I think the MacBook Air has a slightly better setup, although the iPad Air is very impressive with regard to media consumption and music listening. But I'll do a little test here and allow you to decide which speaker setup you like better. Well, after doing that, I think I can at least conclude that the iPad Air definitely gets loud with its dual stereo speakers. Uh, however, the MacBook Air has more nuance and it sound more clarity, so I like that a bit better. Next up, let's quickly go over input or I.O. The iPad Air has one USB Type-C port and also another one if you add the Magic Keyboard case, although that's only capable of charging your iPad, whereas um, the MacBook Air has three. It has two Thunderbolt or USB-C ports and also a headphone jack, which is important, of course, if you are somebody who uses wired headphones for music production or whatever you do. So keep that in mind as well. We have a more versatile um, I.O. setup here, which can allow you to charge and also hook up to an external uh, hard drive or SD SSD, for example, like a T5, although you can use one on here as well with the Files app, so keep that in mind. And speaking of storage, um, base storage with the iPad Air is 64 gigabytes. Base storage with the MacBook Air is 256 gigs on board, although if you are doing more creative work if you, or if you need you know, like extra space, it's always recommended, or I always recommend that you get an external SSD, so at the end of the day, it doesn't matter like too much, although 64 gigs is a bit more like tight in terms of what you can fit on here. If you need to work on projects, you can definitely use an external SSD, no problem. Although I will say, having quadruple that amount of storage does give you a bit more wiggle room, so keep that in mind as well. Next up, let's very, very briefly touch on camera capabilities here. This will be very quick. The iPad Air has a front and back facing camera, a front seven megapixel camera, a capable of 1080p 60 video, whereas it has a 12 megapixel back facing camera capable of 4K 60 video. So there's an actual camera set up here, whereas with the MacBook Air, it still has a kind of crappy uh, 720p front facing camera, which is good enough for zoom and stuff like that, but still like, like, come on, like we gotta get a higher resolution here. However, once again, it is utilitarian. You know, this is a laptop and they wanna keep the screen thin, so they're gonna keep it like low cost and low resolution. So it is what it is in it, but it still like works decently for Zoom once again. And I've used it for video calls and I do them all the time because I'm in college, duh, we're all doing like remote meetings and this should be more than enough for that. And of course the iPad is pretty overkill in the camera department. Next up, let's briefly touch on battery life and just very generally speaking with regard to basic tasks like web surfing and video watching, MacBook Air is going to pull ahead here. Apple's figures generally are pretty accurate, although they are optimistic, but Apple gives the MacBook Air a rating of like around 18 hours of video playback within their Apple TV app and 15 hours of wireless web usage, whereas the iPad Air gets just a solid 10, which is fine. It'll get you to the day, no problem. I have had no issues with this device and iPads generally 
generally can do that. But if you want a one to two day device, if you're just doing basic stuff, once again, MacBook Air is going to be where it's at. However, if you are doing heavier stuff like video editing or gaming, you're gonna wanna plug in regardless. Also, Zoom calls will drain your devices pretty quickly. You know, video chatting tends to do that. So if you're gonna be, you know, doing intensive stuff, Either way, you're gonna plug in, so it doesn't really matter, but if you want a device that will last you longer on the road for like word processing and video watching and you know, like Gmail and whatever, once again, MacBook Air is the device you're gonna wanna buy. Next up, let's talk about performance within these devices here. And conveniently enough, both are Apple Silicon-based devices. Their processors are made by TSMC. They're based off of Apple's five nanometer architecture. And the M1 is actually based off of the A14. It's just a beefier version, probably very similar to the A14X that we'll find in the iPad Pro 2021 models or whatever. But uh, just generally speaking, um, this is more of a mobile chip on the inside of here. Like this is the chip you can find in the iPhone 12 and the iPhone 12 Pro. It's a six core one, whereas the M1 is an eight core chip. And I can demonstrate that here with a Geekbench uh, benchmark here that I can run. So, and while this is running, this device has four gigabytes of RAM. This device has eight and up to 16, depending on how you configure it. So here are the scores. And while the A14 is impressive by itself, it actually outperforms the i5 in my baseline MacBook Pro from last year. Year, um, the scores with the M1 are just nuts. I mean, 1700 single core and then 7600 or 7500 plus with multi-core. I've seen 7600 in some cases. Um, it, it's an i7 territory. This is like 16 inch MacBook Pro territory. So if you wanna do anything heavy ended, like video editing, for example, with LumaFusion, which you can actually download on the MacBook Air now, because with this ARM processor, you can pretty much run any iPhone or iPad app, although, for example, LumaFusion is not very well optimized right now. Like, look at this view where it's tiny. Um, if you wanna do video editing or 3D rendering, the MacBook Air is gonna be the device you wanna opt for, or the MacBook Pro if you want, of course, better thermals, like I demonstrated in my MacBook Air versus MacBook Pro test, but that's not super relevant to this video. So if you wanna do anything more creative, more CPU intensive, of course, you're going to want to buy the device that is more powerful, especially if you're considering this whole ensemble. If this is the same cost, you might as well go here. And also something to keep in mind, and this sort of goes into the next topic here. Um, let's talk about just the operating systems. So Mac OS is now very much integrated into iPad OS and iOS because now it's running off of the same types of chips found in iPhone and iPad. Like I just said, you can run iPhone and iPhone software or applications on this device directly off the app store, which is huge because the iPhone and iPad app ecosystem is gigantic. So if you have any apps that you wanted to run on here, you can also run them on here. Granted, you can't use like a touch screen. So if it like requires a stylus or whatever, or your finger, you're gonna be out of luck, or you're just gonna have to use the cursor, which is, you know, by itself a positive quality. I do think that um, there is a place or a space for trackpads and cursors. Like I prefer it when I'm, for example, you know, writing papers and stuff like that and highlighting text. But of course you get the same sort of experience here with the magic keyboard and similar cases with trackpads that Apple graces with their trackpad drivers. But yeah, once again, it's a real treat that these devices can now run any iPhone and iPad app. And not only that, they can run Intel apps as well through Rosetta, for example, like Minecraft Java. I mean, it runs really beautifully, even though this isn't a native app. So I can play this. For example, I did a whole um, test here. This is a great device for Java Minecraft, by the way. It can output at 60 FPS, no problem. So we can open this up here. But yeah, like can your iPad do this? Yes, there's Minecraft Pocket Edition, but can it run full-fledged Java PC games or even Steam games for that matter technically? No, it can't because it doesn't have the power of Mac OS and Rosetta. So that will be a differentiating factor between the Mac and the iPad, at least for the next few years. So this is really nice to see. And also beyond just games, you can run full-fledged professional software like Adobe Photoshop, which I use all the time for my work. So, you know, although there are great alternatives on the app store, like Affinity Photo and stuff like that, you can run full-fledged Photoshop. Once again, although I didn't sign in here on the MacBook Air, um, as you should be able to, it is a Mac for that matter. But yeah, Adobe is going to develop their apps for the Mac pretty soon. So you're gonna have Apple Silicon based Adobe apps. So they might bring that to the iPad, but I don't know. I mean, the MacBook Air is a very capable device, even though it doesn't have a touch screen. But enough with me praising the MacBook Air. I'm gonna end this video talking about the positive qualities of the iPad um, Air here. The biggest thing with this is note taking, I have to say. The Apple Pencil is just something people have fallen in love with. I certainly did. It's a huge reason why I brought my iPad Pro and iPads in general. This is 
a very nice note taking device. So if you're not doing creative work or anything, although you could definitely do it on here, if you wanna take bomb digital notes, this is the device you're gonna to wanna to go for. It brings everything that's great with iPad Pro into a more affordable form factor. I mean, without the keyboard case here, which you can opt for if you want, um, this is like a $650 to $700 ensemble, depending on if you have educational pricing available. So this is a very great student oriented device. And so is the MacBook Air now more than ever, now that it has more power, which can accommodate other workflows and stuff like that. But once again, if you wanna do digital note taking with the Apple Pencil, and I've demoed that in countless videos, so I won't really do that here. But if you want to do digital note taking, this is the device. And of course you can buy a keyboard to accommodate writing papers and also being able to take advantage of your display here um, more like you would with a laptop. But if you want a laptop experience and you want laptop power, the MacBook Air is now more powerful than ever, so I very much consider this as well. Although in the past, um, with like the i3 that was in the last gen um, $900 MacBook Air, I would honestly um, opt for the iPad Air considering the fact that the A14 is so much more powerful than that dual core processor. But now that you know M1 is in here, the MacBook Air is now more enticing than ever. I would say, even though once again, it has the limitations of not having a touchscreen and no stylus support. But again, that's something you have to decide based off of your own individual needs. And before I wrap up this comparison here, if you are considering digital note taking, I would highly recommend checking out Paper Lake Screen Protectors. Full disclosure, they are a channel sponsor, but I live by their product. Um, I use it with my daily driver iPad Pro every day for note taking, and it just brings a very realistic paper surface experience to you know iPad note taking, which I really like, because I, for many years, took notes in composition notebooks and on paper with pencil and pens, so I like having a more engaging experience here. And also, it's a screen protector. I'm sure you've seen this sort of gash on my my iPad's display here. Thankfully, that's on the screen protector and not the screen itself. So not only do you have some protection, but also you get a fantastic paper-like surface. So if you're interested, I'll leave a link in the video description. It is an affiliate link, so every purchase helps out the channel. So yeah, definitely check it out once again, if you are interested. And that about wraps things up here. I hope this video was helpful. Once again, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave a like if you want to, comment if you have any questions, suggestions, or opinions, and of course, subscribe for more content like this. I will probably have an iPad Pro versus MacBook Pro video coming tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. And as always, I'm Noah, and I will catch you all in the next one.